We have here Dan from uh, Facebook, who's going to talk to us about resource control. Thank you. Thanks so much. So uh, originally I was supposed to give this talk with Tejan, who works with me at Facebook. We both work out of the New York office. Uh, I work on containers, and Tejan works on the Linux kernel. Uh, he works on C groups in particular, so he's intimately familiar with all the details here. Uh, I will try to do my best to represent him well here, but uh, we'll see where we get. Uh, so, ooh, losing signal? All right, hopefully that does not happen too much more often. So uh, the kind of high-level view of Facebook infrastructure that you need for context on this talk, we run a lot of different services. There's web servers, there's load balancers, there's thousands and thousands of different microservices that kind of comprise Facebook infrastructure. Uh, there's all, also a lot of data stores, databases, key value stores, caches, you name it, it runs inside Facebook. And the vast majority of our servers that run in our data centers are Linux servers. The workload runs. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if there's an issue on my end here or not. We'll hopefully live with this, but uh, maybe there, there's an issue to be fixed. Uh, so yeah, the vast majority of our machines are, are Linux servers. Uh, the workloads run in containers. Our container system is called Tupperware. That's what I work on. Uh, and we have a set of system services that run across every machine uh, 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 in the fleet. And you can think of these as like, this is like the Facebook operating system. There's some number of services like Chef, like SSHD, common ones you've heard of, a lot of ones that are uh, custom for our purpose. Uh, let's see if we can get the slides working again. Let me unplug and try plugging in. All right, I'll hold my laptop above my head. Uh, We're going to see if we can get another cable. Just yeah. Be patient. All right, nope. <laughs> all right. All right, I'll start all over again. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, the Tupperware agent, which is responsible for launching containers, all these services I'll refer to as widely deployed binaries or WDBs. Um, again, most of these you've probably heard of. Some of them you are, are Facebook custom. But uh, uh, the whole idea here is what, is what are we talking about when we, when we mention resource control? Right? The vast majority of software developers at Facebook write services that run in their containers. We have a fairly wide amount of, of uh, um, services that run on the, on the machine. And we have a lot of questions about how do we manage the resources of a single machine, from memory, compute, and I.O. primarily. So one question that someone might, might have is, like, how do we ensure that a service gets enough resources to run successfully? Uh, what guarantees can we provide to service owners as far as how much they should be able to expect to be able to use on a particular machine? Um, what happens if one of these widely deployed binaries regresses in its memory consumption? This is something that has happened, and how do we prevent this from causing fleet-wide failures, for example, where suddenly we have no memory on any of our machines, it starts thrashing, and we're out. Uh, Another case that has happened a bunch is a misbehaving workload suddenly starts consuming a bunch of memory. The machine starts misbehaving or acting up, and, and we don't have enough I.O. going around. Uh, and then suddenly the host is unresponsive, and then the workload fails over to another machine and does the same thing, and we start seeing these cascading failures. Uh, finally, there's a whole slew of things that we want to look at, like workload stacking, prioritizing multiple workloads on the same machine, dealing with issues like latency versus batch sensitivity in, in different jobs. All this kind of loosely falls under this domain of resource control. I'm going to cover in this talk a lot of how we approach these problems. Um, I'm going to talk about C groups. And when I talk about C groups, I'll, I'll uh, 
exclusively talk about C group V2. If you really want to know the differences, uh, actually, before I get going, like show of hands, who here is familiar with C groups? All right, good, good chunk of people. Uh, who here is familiar with the distinction between C group V2 and C group V1? All right, also a pretty good, good set. If you want to know that distinction, please see Chris Downs' talk uh, at FOSDEM 2017, uh, where he goes into this in depth. I will give a very high-level overview of C groups. Uh, they're basically the Linux kernel mechanism for uh, uh, doing resource control. Uh, Tajin couldn't make it, but I stole an image of him off the internet and a quote from him. Uh, he refers to C group as a mechanism to organize processes hierarchically and distribute system resources along this hierarchy. Um, the way I kind of translate this, and I'm lying a little bit about some of the details here, but uh, that's just to simplify things. C group is a tree. You have one root C group, and you can have children of, of, of C groups. Processes belong to one and only one leaf C group. So it's this hierarchical structure that we can use to do resource control. System D calls non-leaf C group slices. You'll, you'll hear me use that term a bunch as well. Um, and each C group can be used to measure the consumption of resources. So at any point in the tree, you can say how much CPU, memory, or I.O., or any number of things uh, are being consumed. Uh, and then you can also control the distribution of resources. You can set resource limits and a bunch of other configuration at various points in the tree. Um, I'll explicitly call out this is not like a security mechanism. It's totally orthogonal, orthogonal to namespaces and cheroots. Um, but you, we, for example, to construct containers, we use both C groups and these other concepts as well. Um, and this is all configurable through systemd. Uh, I recommend you look at the systemd resource control man page for, for details about how to do that. Uh, I'm going to pretty much exclusively refer to the uh, kernel C group uh, mechanism names. There's usually a one-to-one -one mapping to systemd uh, configuration. Um, and I, I'm not going to call those out. Just, just look at the man page if you're interested. Um, so C group, as I mentioned, has a bunch of control mechanisms. And I thought I'd give like a really, really brief overview of how that looks. So one is for each C group, you can set weights. Um, this is like CPU weight or IO weight that I'm going to talk about. And basically allows you to give out proportional amounts of, of a CPU or whatever resource uh, across this tree. Usually only child, child uh, or sibling C groups can really compete on, on a resource like that. Uh, but weights work nicely because they just kind of divide evenly. If, en if anyone wants to consume more CPU, uh, they can. As soon as it becomes contended, then you start applying CPU weight to determine who, who gets how much. Um, limits, which I think most people would be familiar with, things like CPU.max, memory.max. I can say this C group and all the processes that live within it can uh, only take five gigabytes of memory. That's a, a hard limit. And if they reaches that and we can't get any more memory, you run out, you call, call the oom um killer uh, and kill things. There's a few cases of allocations I'm not going to cover really. These are, are like reserving, setting aside resources so they can only exclusively be used for a single purpose. This is really mostly useful in like real time use cases. Uh, we don't play with this too much at Facebook. Um, and protections uh, are kind of the, the last category of control mechanism. This is something like memory.low. So the way memory works is once you start hitting contention for memory, the kernel begins to look what kind of memory can be reclaimed, file cache can be flushed, all this sort of stuff. Memory.low allows us to protect the C group's memory from reclaim. To say, OK, if you are under 4 gigs of memory, you will not have your memory reclaimed. We'll prefer for other services and other C groups to do that. Um, our, our resource control philosophy, this is kind of like how we approach all this work, is I kind of broke it down to these three topics I'll, I'll cover. One, I think, quite obvious, we, we want across our fleet to be as homogenous as possible. Uh, the other thing I'm going to talk about is we try to avoid setting limits for a number of reasons. And finally, like, we really depend heavily on monitoring and visibility to make all of this function well. Um, I'll, I'll start talking about the homogeneity. The, this is probably the most obvious one, but like having configuration that is different depending on where you run, what data center you run, or what kind of workload you run, 
really makes it difficult for us because configuration can bit rot. We want to update things. Suddenly, we have to update several places. But also, making changes to this is costly. You oftentimes don't know the effect until you've run it at scale for quite a while before you know, did this make a positive change or not? Uh, and the third and final thing is, to most developers at Facebook, they don't need to care about what machine they're running on. They get a container, they get some guarantees, and they go forth from there. Uh, and that's why having homogenous resource control is really a goal for us. We do have to make some compromises here, but uh, uh, this is kind of part of our philosophy. Um, the, the other thing is avoiding limits, which I think may be somewhat controversial to people, but there's a number of reasons for this. Every time you hit a C group limit, uh, you are saying, I'm okay with ra wasting resources here. Like, that's fu kind of fundamentally the case. If I hit CPU.max and I had idle CPU, well, that, that means I'm just limited in, in, in consuming that CPU. I'll use the term in like operating systems theory, you call this non-work conserving. There's more work to do and we can't uh, use it. And we want to avoid limits uh, in part because we want to increase utilization of our uh, data centers. Um, there's another, uh, uh, another big reason, which is that hitting a limit is like a really, really heavy-handed way to, to budget our resources. You know, suddenly my service is working, but it's at 99% of the, the limit, no issues, right? I increase utilization 2% more, and now I've got like, you know, I'm out of memory, I'm killing everything, and that can turn into some pretty major issues across the whole fleet. And so because of this, like the, the limit isn't, like we need warning well before we hit the limit in many cases, and actually applying it can, can cause these kind of like cascading failures we see where one thing changed and suddenly uh, across the fleet we're hitting issues. Um, the other thing is, of course, configuring limits just requires a lot of tuning, right? Uh, uh, suddenly you start hitting up against the limit, you have to decide, should I bump it? Is this limit too, too high? I need to get it lower. Uh, and the final case, which is a little more of a like, pragmatic uh, aspect of this, is that we've hit a lot of priority inversions with limits. As soon as something starts getting limited, uh, there are many cases where another process behind it can get blocked or something like that. In many cases, these are bugs that we can go and fix in the kernel, um, but the, we, will, we sort of feel like we'll always be finding these kinds of cases. I'll give one cool kind of war story about this. Um, so there's one system service in particular that we run on, on pretty much every machine in the fleet. Uh, and among other things it does, it logs proc PID command line for all processes. Um, and the behavior of doing that is, like the command line of a process lives in its address space. So in order to read proc PID command line of all processes, we go through and we acquire, in the kernel, it acquires this MMAP SEM, the semaphore that protects the address space from being mutated while we're looking at it. And then it goes, reads the command line. Um, this isn't exactly how it happened, but uh, it's kind of an equivalency. Uh, someone added cpu.max to the system service for safety. In case something changes to it, it is limited from taking up all the CPU on the machine. Suddenly what happens is that we found cases where a service was acquiring MAPSEM and then would relinquish the CPU because it was at its CPU limit. And so what happens is that, you know, whatever that PID was, for example, could be trying to spawn a thread and it's blocked on its own MMAP semaphore because this other process had acquired it and blocked. This is just like a classic, classic priority inversion, right? The, the CPU limit on the WDB we had is preventing other services from making forward progress. This particular one, uh, uh, I think we, we can probably find solutions for by, in the Linux kernel, having it not relinquish CPU uh, 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 while, while it's holding the MMAP SEM here. But we found many of these kind of, kinds of cases. And if we don't apply limits, what happens is the only case where this is really an issue is if we're just out of CPU on the machine. And then you kind of expect you'll see some stalls and, and whatnot. And whether that's because the process is holding the lock or not, doesn't really matter. As soon as there's enough open CPU, you make forward progress. Um, monitoring visibility is a... a, a tricky topic, but basically we use cgroups as a way to classify things like kind of what is the tax we are taking away off of all, all resources by running the Facebook OS, right? Whatever that, that collection of widely deployed binaries and everything else that we have, 
how do we end up you know, uh, 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 tracking that and driving it down uh, 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 to, to make workloads you know, be able to use as much as they want. Um, similarly, like, how can we you know, provide guarantees to service owners by saying, okay, here's how much that we're using uh, 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 across the fleet, here's what you can expect to use safely and, and make that feasible. This is a really hard problem. Johannes is giving a talk tomorrow about uh, uh, memory sizing in particular, where th this has been a challenge, and I, I encourage you guys to take a look at that talk. Uh, I, I won't go into further details here, though. Um, so w w I, I wanted to get actually pretty concrete here about like, what does the Facebook C group hierarchy look like, and what do we, how do we apply our various resource control mechanisms here? Um, so the root of the C group, we have system slice, where, which by default, if you run a systemd service, that's where it would run. Uh, the, that part should be common to, to a, a lot of different systems. We create two additional top-level C group slices here. One is the workload, and the, the, the third one, the third slice we have is host critical. Uh, and the idea is almost everything that we just run on the system, these WDBs, you name it, chef, or uh, a lot of monitoring that we do, that all runs in system slice. Uh, I'll dive in a little deeper into the workload slice, but those are where we run containers and anything that is really responsible for whatever workload we're running here, the web servers, the databases, you name it. Host critical slice is the stuff that we need to have up for this host to be really operational. So that's SSHD, it's our user space um killer, it's Tupperware agent, a couple other things like Dbus uh, uh, are in there as well. So you can sort of, like, this high-level categorization is enough for us to kind of say, uh, uh, apply a bunch of, like, logical resource control things we would want to say, like, host critical should be protected at all costs, right? Anything that interferes with that, we, we will take action, right? The system slice can oftentimes be delayed or stalled if it means that it, it, the workload is protected from that happen, from, from any ill effects due to the system slice. It's fine if we run Chef, you know, 5% slower or something. It's oftentimes not fine if we run a web server 5% slower. Uh, the workload slice we further, oh, uh, sorry, I had slides here. Um, covered those. Uh, the workload slice I, we further dig into three things. Workload TW is basically the slice that the Tupperware owns. This is the container system. When it launches containers, it always throws them into workload TW slice. Workload WDB slice is another uh, 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 place where we run some widely deployed binaries. They live on the host, uh, but they provide some functionality that the workload depends on. Oftentimes, this is things like uh, caching configuration data or a number of things that don't live inside the container, but otherwise the workload induces a lot of uh, uh, resource consumption from and is highly dependent on it working well. Uh, there aren't many of these, but uh, uh, this is kind of a concession to the fact that some things on the host do not always live inside the container, but provide some useful functionality for the workload. And the final one is workload TW commands dot slice. And this is Tupperware, the, the you know, container agent on behalf of the workload, doing some particularly resource intensive work. So that's setting up a chroot or fetching, fetching packages for a container. All of that we want to, to make sure is properly isolated and, and uh, accounted for as part of the workload, really. Um, so uh, the next question is, like, how do we configure it all? And as I said, we, we avoid limits as much as possible. Uh, the, the three things we've relied on are memory.low, which as I said is a way to say, as long as you are below this watermark, you are not getting, getting reclaimed from memory. We prefer to reclaim memory from other C groups. Uh, CPU.wait similarly is, is just a way for us to divide up CPU. I'm not going to get into the like, two specific numbers here just because I don't think it's particularly interesting. Uh, and a lot of this is just experimentally uh, uh, validated. Uh, the third thing we've used, which I haven't talked about, is IO latency. Uh, so one thing that may not be obvious, but if you start protecting memory, meaning you know, suddenly this, this C group, the workload slice, for example, gets most of the memory on the machine protected. And when we hit you know, memory shortage, we start reclaiming heavily from system slice, for example. Uh, 
Uh, as soon as you start doing that, you start inducing a lot of I.O. from system slice because it starts flushing to the page cache and having to read a lot from the page cache. So if you're protecting memory, you're, you need to also protect I.O. or else you're just translating the problem into an I.O. shortage very quickly. This is anyone who's, who's like run a Linux machine and run any number of you know, processes that consume a lot of memory, the first thing that really starts limiting you is the I.O. You're just thrashing on the disk and, and not making forward progress. So I.O. is really important for us. Historically, we've used I.O. latency as our control. The way this works is you say, uh, I want, you know, uh, the workload slice should hit this target of 40 millisecond I.O.s. And in the kernel, after it issues IOs, it checks how long did those, those, uh, those take and decides, OK, if we are over our tar target, we need to throttle some other C group that has a higher IO latency target uh, uh, set for it. This works OK, but we oftentimes hit cases where we're throttling and there's plenty of available IO on the system. Uh, this has to do with, depending on, on the device, you see very different behavior. Uh, so, some devices see IO latency spikes, and it's not because uh, uh, the disk is you know, overutilized. It's because, say, the, uh, uh, the disk had to spin a bunch to make, make certain operations. So we've used IO latency a lot. It is not great, though. And one new thing we're pretty excited about is IO weight. Uh, this, uh, I don't know this exact kernel version it came out in, but it's been uh, this year developed. Uh, and what this does is it creates a cost model for each I.O. You can say every I.O. for however many bytes it reads or writes and however many operations you're making, you can have some predictive cost of how much this consumes out of our, our total I.O. budget. Uh, and use that then like you would any other like scheduling algorithm on top of that to say, all right, this C group gets this percentage of this, the, the I.O. available, this one does not. Um, and with that in place, we really have all work conserving controls, right? Memory.low, CPU.weight, and I.O.weight, as long as there is available resource on a machine, a C group gets it, regardless of how these are configured. Um, we also only set these on the slices and the containers. We don't do individual system services uh, configuration here. Uh, and the idea here is just to simplify our configuration. We don't have to tune a lot of things constantly. Uh, uh, works pretty well. We do have to change our configuration depending on the hardware. It, this is like obvious with memory, right? Machines with different memory, you need to protect different amounts. Uh, the way I.O. weight works is you have to parameterize the cost of I.O. depending on your disk. Uh, and, and so we do have different configurations. But the number of different hardware configurations is not that high compared to the number of different workloads we run. Um, so the, like the outcomes of this approach, I, I guess I should say be before going forward, like we set CPU.weight so that you know, system slice gets some forward progress guarantees, and workload slice gets most of the CPU, and similarly, host critical gets its, its share. Same with IO weight, we set some configuration. Memory.low, we, we typically set uh, uh, on the host critical slice and the workload slice to make sure their memory is protected. And if we need to reclaim anything, we take it from the system slice uh, as long as everyone is operating well. Um, so the outcomes of this are that like, our, our configuration doesn't need to be really precise. All the different controls we use have proportional behavior. What I mean by that is, let's say, like, the ideal CPU division for this particular workload and everything else running on the machine is that system slice gets 25% of the CPU, workload slice gets 80%, and host critical is 5% or something. Uh, if I'm off by a few percentage on how that's configured, it's fine. It's, it, like, the, the, the cost of being off is proportional to how much I'm off by. So, giving a workload 80% of the CPU instead of 75% of the CPU is only a, a proportionally not so bad. On the other hand, like limits don't work this way, right? If you set a limit that is 5% too low, you, you, your, your system is broken, right? Um, and there's a lot of why we, we take this approach. Um, the other nice thing is that this only really takes effect when the machine is out of resources. So uh, a, a kind of interesting property here is that when we start to apply all this resource control, the vast majority of machines don't see any issue. Uh, 
It's purely protecting what happens when we are contended for some resource, whether it's memory, compute, or I.O., and deciding who gets what at that point. What that means is that like, a widely deployed binary that has a bug in it that starts leaking memory or consuming a lot of I.O., uh, because of the way we configure everything, it can't harm the workload. We cap the amount that it can in effect. Uh, uh, the truth is that the workload, we, we don't limit anything unless the, the actual machine is contended. But as soon as it is and the workload wants to consume the kind of resources that we guaranteed it, that's when we start really harming this, this uh, uh, system slice and any WDB here. Um, similarly, because we protect host critical, a misbehaving workload cannot take down a host. We will always be able to SSH into a host, always be able to start containers on it or stop containers on it, uh, uh, and a number of other properties that we, we want to guarantee. Just because rebooting being our only option uh, is pretty terrible. Um, Finally, one thing that's like pretty important here is the because we'd only apply these when the machine is contended, small regressions do not have a large blast radius. Suddenly, some WDB starts consuming 5% more memory. It's not running out of memory across the whole fleet. It is consuming 5% more memory, and maybe on the most loaded hosts we have, it's getting harmed a little bit. But this, this means we're not seeing just widespread failures across the fleet when something regresses. Uh, and that's just, you know, uh, kind of our, our, our enforcement mechanism, how we enforce the guarantees here needs to be a little less heavy handed than suddenly we kill everything. Um, when to kill something is policy for us, right? Uh, as long as we're protecting everything, some misbehaving workload or misbehaving system, we, we are protected, you know, all the guarantees we believe we're, we're providing are, are upheld. Uh, and when we want to kill something, is really a matter of, well, this machine isn't doing useful work anyways, we should kill it. Uh, I won't go into further details, but Daniel and Anita are giving a talk about UMD, which is a user space UM killer, and, and how we apply a lot of policy here. Uh, they're giving the, that talk tomorrow as well. Um, so I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up, but uh, uh, there are a bunch of aspects of resource control that we still care about quite a bit and we haven't figured out a lot of this. One is, how do we know that this all works, right? Like, an interesting thing that I, uh, uh, about this is, if the machine is underutilized, none of the resource control takes any effect, right? Everything we're using is work, work conserving. So if you make a change, you oftentimes only see in outlier cases that something is not behaving the way we expect. And it's very hard for us to validate that our configurations are behaving uh, uh, correctly. So we're investing a lot into setting up you know, various synthetic tests and, un, uh, and other ways we can load test uh, uh, systems at Facebook so that we can validate that our guarantees are actually being upheld. And when we make configuration changes, that's safe to do. Um, there's a lot of other resources I didn't talk about. Like everyone thinks, yes, compute, memory, and I.O. is everything. Um, but obviously, networking uh, is something I didn't talk about. All the I.O. control is. Uh, for block I.O. Uh, consuming disk space is something we are always concerned about and we don't have good solutions there yet. Uh, power, like also the just like kind of micro resources, power, cache, memory bandwidth, BPF programs, all these sorts of things can consume a lot of resources and uh, uh, we don't yet have good controls to, uh, uh, to do this. Um, Finally, one thing I didn't really talk about is like how, how do container users get to say how much resource they consume? Um, right now, the interface we use is, uh, I think, fairly standard thing you would see with any kind of cloud provider. You say, I need a container with X gigabytes of RAM and X, Y CPUs. Like, personally, I'm not sure that's the, the best interface. One, like, how do you know how much you should, should consume? But also, like, that's not what a, a developer often cares about, right? They really just want their workload to run, right? How, wherever you find it. And I think we have a lot of like, introspection to be done on our current interface and how we can expose it uh, better for users. Um, and the final thing that like, keeps me awake at night is just how would we improve the visibility of all of this? 
Developers don't develop their software well for cases where they're suddenly low on resources. You hit timeouts, you hit all sorts of problems, and that's oftentimes when they need to debug and understand what happened on this machine. Uh, and, and exposing as much as we can to the users so that they can develop is really important for us uh, and, and something we, we continue to iterate on. Uh, that's all I have, so I'm happy to take questions from here. Uh, thanks so much. Hi. Uh, so you're putting all the containers in one under one basically root, which is workload slice. How do you do resource management inside that slice so that one container does not take down the other containers? Yeah. So the from the host perspective, uh, so Tupperware is what controls that, right? But within the workload slice, doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter what we do underneath the specifically workload TW slice. Um, there we do things like uh, a container can say, I want two gigabytes of RAM. We can set memory limits there or set memory.low, depending on how, how the user configured their container. Uh, and if you run mul we run multiple containers underneath the, the slice, each of these has their own control that is configured by Tupperware. So we can, again, usually, depending on, on the case, we, we prefer to use uh, uh, these like, work-conserving limits. But a software developer can say, no, actually enforce my limits. I want you to cap me at four gigabytes of memory. If they don't do that, it's still fine. You can run other containers alongside of it, and because of memory.low and other proportional controls, it just works out. It's oftentimes that users want the determinism of, I actually run out of memory at two gigabytes and, and, and my workload dies. Uh, but that's all through the Tupperware interfaces. Right. Uh, well, you mentioned something about faults and injections. How do you inject faults into C groups and things like that? Like specifically, try and force uh, slices to run out of memory or contend on something else. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about that because I'm sure uh, Daniel and Anita are going to talk about that tomorrow when they talk about UMD. But uh, basically, just s synthetic workloads that consume a resource. You can you can add them to a C group and see what happens. Uh, and this is a test we've done done a bunch, and uh, you can see the effect. Any other questions? No? Thank you, Dan. Thank you.